Hello everyone. Today we have a special guest, a wonderful composer who lives in Canada. A composer with a Polish origin because Norbert Pale, who uh, was born in Poland, but he who lived for a long time in Germany and who also studied in uh, Krakow for a moment, studied with the professor uh, Bujarski. But after that, he moved to the States and he graduated from Julia School of Music, New England Conservatory and Cornell University. And currently he is a head of the composition of the music and theory department at the University of Toronto. And we have a pleasure that he took this invitation and he will share with us during this quarantine talks about his last year as a composer, about his life during pandemic, so as a teacher, as a chair of the department, we don't know much what is going on in Canada, so I'm sure there'll be a lot of things to talk. We will also discuss a little bit about his music and also a tiny questions also about Chopin. Nice to see you. How are you? I'm very good. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, pleasure, pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure to talk to everybody who will eventually listen to it. Thank you very much. So Norbert, tell me, how is the weather, by the way, today in Toronto? Because you live in Toronto, right? I am in Toronto, yes. And uh, it's okay. By our standards, it's okay. Uh, I, it's probably six degrees or something. And that's fa fantastic here. Yeah. Because we've, we've, you know, we usually have tough winters in Toronto. So yes. it feels like spring is sort of coming. But we probably have another month to wait before. We really right. feel it. Right. But how is the situation now when you start uh, at, the, at your school, at the university? The University of Toronto, uh, so the Faculty of Music um, and the University of Toronto, we pretty much shut down, you know, back oh, a year wow. ago in March. Um, and uh, it hasn't been good. I mean, if, so I teach all my uh, composition now remotely for, for a whole year now. I've been teaching remotely through Zoom, like the way we are talking right now. Um, and, you know, for composition, it, it does, it's not bad. It doesn't, it, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, we are able to share scores, um, uh, screen share scores. We're able to share uh, sound. So it's not too bad. The bigger problem is that that our ensembles have also shut down for the year. You know, our orchestra, our chamber ensembles, our wind ensembles, everything has become remote. And um, and that's and that's the big problem for us composers, for the students also, you know, that they, they were really struggling to get any of their music heard, right? And, and how do they feel, how the students, about this? I, I think it actually makes them depressed. Uh, I, I, I felt like at the very beginning, maybe there was a bit, of uh, of positivity still because people thought oh now I I'm at home I have I can have more time I can have my computer and you know no distractions but uh, but the reality is that unless unless we're connected to each other and we interact and we get feedback and we hear music uh, it's just our imagination dries up after some time you know just in isolation that's right. Um, and and uh, I think for for artists, it's good to have it's good to be alone in in a way because that's how we work. But we also need, uh, uh, you know, from time to time, we need to be um, among other composers, among our peers, and we need to hear music. And and I I've I've felt that with the students the spirit has been dropping and especially after after christmas uh, you know coming after in this new after year December, yes, there is a kind of a stagnation you know they mm -hmm. they don't they don't some don't compose at all some have a hard time composing they struggle for ideas they um they just don't feel motivated um with no performances around the you know uh, to look forward to and it's tough. I think everybody really looks forward to returning uh, in person, and we really hope that in September this will happen. It's still kind of, you know, it's not sure, obviously, yeah. at this point. Um, I just had a, I just talked to someone from the University of Montreal yesterday, and I just, I realized through this conversation that actually every school is a little bit different. So the University of Montreal, strangely enough, they figured out some way of keeping the ensembles operational. Like right away, they figured out a way to really spread them out, and um, and they have been functioning this whole year with actual performances and reading sessions and you know uh, all that. And we haven't had it. So it every been... school in Canada is different, yes, and also different city is different. Yeah, they, they they are. Each school has its own kind of right 
to to you know to, to make some decisions i think most schools are in the same boat like we are that they pretty much shut down completely for the year uh, but there are some exceptions and um, i mean for us we made an exception for some of the studio teaching for the instruments um, so some instrumental teaching was in person with you know sort of screens set up and ventilation and all these uh, safety measures and uh, and it was optional so students had the option of doing it from home but but some some were coming to school for composition it was 100% uh, online online digital how is for you as a teacher how do you feel do you think it's harder for you my whole my whole studio is here and it's easy for me to say show my students whatever i want to show them Okay. musical examples uh you know show a score a pdf or this i can just pull it up i have it ev i have everything here um so that's good uh, the i think the the disadvantage is simply that no matter what like you still feel um that kind of division of this that the screen sort of divides you from your students so it's 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 not quite as a direct experience as as you you know as uh, as we're used to but also i just i i really miss uh, the routine of you know getting dressed in the morning going on the subway you know going to school having a kind of a scheduled day where i have this meeting then this meeting then i have lunch then i you know and um and this whole routine which has so many advantages like you interact with people that you talk to many different people you run into people on on you know into students uh, while you're walking through the faculty and and you just start chatting and uh, uh, and that's not happening now now you only meet with the specific people you made appointments with um and also just physical exercise you know it's just uh it's just so important to move all the time and just sitting at the in yeah. the chair all day and staring at the screen uh it it wears it, it just makes the whole think kind of unpleasant you know yeah. uh, and you, you as a head of composition you had some probably some ideas how to deal with that right you had to decide how to do all of this remotely teaching right? yeah yeah we had to make various decisions and we did our best i mean we still preserved some um, some aspects of of a community like for example we have i'm running a composers forum every uh every tuesday night and that's when all the composers are getting together on zoom and oh, we have mm -hmm. all kinds of topics and we and share Sarah, music oh, interesting. yeah and we have discussions on various sort of aesthetic uh, stylistic questions all kinds of things and actually that has been very good um i feel like in some ways the students uh, through zoom feel a little bit more encouraged to share their opinions like if they're in person mm -hmm. maybe they're a little bit shy and like mm -hmm. on the screen it's much easier to just say something um or even to type it into the chat so so that has has been okay and and it certainly helps them to stay uh to to feel still like a community we we still had um we basically have been taking a lot of advantage of our electroacoustic music studio uh, where students still can come in in very small groups and with various safety measures but they can record their chamber music in there mm -hmm. and we have been putting an emphasis on um uh, helping them to also um record video to go with it, to go with it because now like with this kind of online presence uh, just the audio is not quite enough to get people engaged so students have been actually i actually created this kind of it's like a competition for students to submit um uh, to submit music but with Im with some kind of image with with film with videos with yes with, 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 yeah exactly exactly so in some cases it's as simple as filming the musicians perform mm -hmm. but like from different angles with different cameras to make it more engaging and in some cases it is something else some you know some landscapes moving you know in the background whatever it is and that's been that's been good that kind of i think it opened new um uh, uh, new kind of doors for them uh, to uh to things they haven't explored before you know mm -hmm. because we're just we were just right focused on writing our scores but now we have this additional you know learning yes. curve yeah 
But yeah. you know, I, I, that's very actually surprising and also good to know because many schools also they shut down their studios for this time. At, at least we had that, exactly. And we had a yeah. limit of, I think, five performers in the studio because it's, you know, that's how many sort of little rooms there are and everybody's in their box. And uh, But then we would present these YouTube concerts, you know, where, where this content, where the music was uh, recorded and with cameras also and and the audio. And then we would have uh, YouTube concerts and we would all attend them and chat, you know, like mm -hmm. make, make comments after the pieces and and it's it's quite nice actually i mean you know it could be worse at least we have that okay. good to hear that really good to hear but how's the situation of vaccination in in toronto currently is it going very well or it's uh, canada is unfortunately uh, far behind i don't know oh, the so kind of whole political situation why this happened but uh oh. canada is is very far behind uh, pretty much uh, all, all, all countries. I think we're the, like in the bottom two percent in the world, and Whoa. and it's there are various reasons why this is happening. But mm -hmm. but uh, that's all to say that the process is only kind of beginning here in Canada. Yeah, you, you grew up in Poland, Germany, but you also studied in the um, Krakow Music Academy, which is now Penderecki Music Academy. As you know, Penderecki Music Academy. Mm -hmm. But then you came to the States, which is, which is different. You studied at Juilliard Grade School, also Cornell University. So if you compare, do you think your music changed because of the experiences of the different, I would say, surroundings? If you can tell us about this, what do you think? Oh, it's, it's definitely changed. It definitely okay. changed. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for the kind of the course that life has taken me, that I, had, that I was exposed to all those things because... Um, I mean, I loved uh, studying in Poland uh, at the Academy of Music there. Uh, I, I feel like it was the perfect foundation, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for for my for everything I've learned because the it, it's such a good training there in these kind of fundamental skills, the counterpoint, harmony, you know, all that writing stuff. Fugues, right? Writing, writing fugues, fugues right? Writing oh, you know, all of this, I and know, it's taught. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a harmony. You know, it's another thing. I remember we had this wonderful teacher in Poland. Her name was uh, Fieldorf, Miss Fieldorf. Oh, I and passed she away was... when I was there. Or not that oh, she, yeah. she, she did, yeah. yeah. She was very strict, but wonderful. I mean, uh, I feel like after that, you know, those years in Krakow, I, I had, I kind of knew the, all the basics and I had this kind of freedom to go anywhere from there, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I, and then I, when I went to the States, it's, I think that's when I became a Polish composer, paradoxically, when I went mm -hmm. to the States, you know, because mm -hmm. that's, I think that what happens if, if, if you are abroad, you suddenly r start looking for who you are, like in relation to what, you know, what surrounds you and, and you look for what is making my art unique, you know, and that's when you actually go back to your roots more than when you are in Poland, you know? So I was, when I was in Poland, I feel like I was more of a international composer. And when I went um, to the US, I became more of a Polish composer. And, uh, and I started becoming very interested in Polish folklore. There was a phase when I was writing a lot of music connected to the music of, uh, of Podhale and the Kurpie region and, and other sort of Polish folk, uh, folk music treasures. Um, but and, American education, yes, then yeah, you know, came and, uh, and how? And, but but the American education was what what was great about it that it allowed great freedom. I feel mm -hmm. you know, and and that was something uh, in Europe. Uh, I always felt like there was a little bit of a, a I don't know how to say it, but. Uh, certain things were okay to do, other things were not okay to do. It was it was a little bit like a curated uh, effort, and and um, whereas getting uh, states being in the states, I, I felt this incredible uh, amount of freedom. Like I can literally do everything, anything, anything I want, you know, write any music I want, and that you know at first and for a long time this was very it, both encouraging but also kind of debilitating because if you have too much freedom then you also don't know you know what to what to choose from that freedom um and the other thing that was great in america was that every single piece that i wrote everything was performed uh when i was a student in krakow uh it wasn't quite like that i think there was as a composition student there i still felt like most of the stuff i was writing i was just writing 
And when I was done, I put it in a drawer and it was done. Then the next piece, you know, and I heard very little of the stuff that I wrote. And then uh, when I came to America, suddenly every single piece was performed and I had this feedback and, um, and that was very important. And then there are just like very different approaches to everything, different approach to harmony, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's taught differently and, uh, and, and a kind of a whole way of understanding music is Schenkerian way, which is pretty much non-existent in, in Poland, but which was big in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And also Alan Ford is also the set. Alan, Alan Ford, it's very popular, exactly. Yeah. And I went through that too. So the Alan Ford way and, ah. uh, and all of this just becomes sort of part of your tool palette, uh, yes. you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and then, and then after that, you know, coming to Canada, Canada, actually, in terms of the education system and, and, and the way music is taught, I think it's quite similar to the United States. It is. Uh -huh. So it's, it's similar. Okay. Yeah, I think it's similar. Um, but if, I'm trying to think if but there you know, are... But you are teaching in the English-speaking region because Toronto is an English, yes? But there are also French-speaking right. regions. So it might also be different. It might be, yeah. Might I, be, I, might I, be. I am 100% sure that Quebec is different. They, they, it's almost like, a, almost like a different country, you know? <laughs> uh, and I feel that Quebec, uh, from, from the impressions I got from it, is much more kind of Europe-oriented. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we here in Toronto are much more... USA oriented, USA or you know, th that's mm -hmm. where we look. Mm -hmm. um, but but there is a particular different thing I think uh, about Canada, uh, or maybe not different, but there's a huge emphasis here on 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 um, on this kind of internationality of this country and and on the different uh, cultures that come here and the diversity of it. You know, even more in the states. I mean, the states are already very diverse and 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 open, but Canada is. It's just, uh, yeah. Great, great. But you know, so great. Thank you very much for sharing that, for this explanation. That's very inspiring and good to hear. But I'm also thinking um, about, your, uh, about your music, you know, because you mentioned about these Polish things. Well, we talk about Chopin, but maybe before that, I want to um, ask you, because I found that and also heard some of your words that uh, use the Polish uh, poetry, Polish literature. So you mentioned that, you, but maybe this, then you feel from your country in the distance and then you can dream about this. It's a different perspective when you live in the same place. But yeah. tell me about the um, poems that you choose. I remember two years ago, there was a poem by Mickiewicz. Mickiewicz was uh, also the time of the Chopin, right? Chopin also inspired with the first ballad by the Mickiewicz. So tell me, how do you choose and uh, which poets do you choose for your poetry, uh, for your music? And uh, tell me about this this association text, Polish text to the music that you write. Yeah, uh, that's that's a good question, and uh, and it's something. Um, I mean, I, I'm in, gen in general, I'm I'm very yeah. strongly inspired by poetry. Um, uh, you know, it's it's even when I write, you know, absolute music, even if I write um, orchestra pieces or. or or chamber music, I very often just go to poetry for inspiration. Somewhere in the background, you know, it's there. Um, but but when I set uh, set poetry, I'm particularly picky, you know, uh, about what, what I said. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I have to say that, and that this is not surprising, that the Polish language for me is is still, even after so many years of being abroad, that's where the, like the flow of emotion of what, what I want to do and between the language and the music is the most direct. Like I can, um, I can musicalize the Polish language intuitively and in the most easy and satisfying way. I have a very, very hard time setting English poetry. Very hard time. I did it on a couple of occasions and I, it was a struggle. Like I had to fight against it because it's just, it, there's just something about the English language that I, I have, I, I really don't know what it is, whether it's the sound of it that doesn't inspire me, whether it's uh, um, the syntax, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but... Uh, but, but it's very difficult to write the Polish language. It's a very difficult task. It's a, it's a difficult task, uh, but but for, for me, I, I just, uh, yeah, the, the poetics of it, the, the sound of it, I find inspiring. I love the fact that the vowels are very open, mm -hmm. uh, you way. know, there are no diphthongs. There is, uh, it's just very, very beautiful, open sounds that in, in some ways, the vowels of Polish uh, are quite a bit like the vowels of Italian, which is the ultimate, mm -hmm. the, the best singing language. Um, 
But then also in the Polish language, you have all the consonances, which can be quite complicated, especially for non-Polish singers. Uh, but they add this additional layer of mystery and uh, and almost noise, you know. Uh, and so it's just a very colorful. To, to me, it's the most colorful language that I can I can I can set. Um, so English is difficult. I've also set uh, other language. I set Italian, which um, resulted in a very different kind of music. I said Latin. I wrote a lot in Latin, and uh, and Latin. I find also I, I enjoy setting Latin just because, in some ways, it's so impersonal or something. It's so abstract that it allows me a lot of freedom in the music. It's um, and um, uh, I've said uh, that there are, there are other languages that I'm forgetting now. Um, How about German? Because you live in Germany. What is the order? This is odd that I haven't said German. You haven't. Uh, I I should because yeah, it's it's like it's my second language. My second so my first language is Polish, second German. My third language is English. But I actually now that I think of it, I haven't said um, anything in English. Anything in, in English in, in, in German? Sorry, in German. Yeah, absolutely, in, 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 in German. German. In German. I haven't said uh, German. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there are other languages, and I'm trying to remember now. Maybe French. What... French. I think I did some French at some mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Uh, Spanish. I said Spanish, uh, and that was also a lot of fun, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So linguistic are very important for you in your music language, very, right? Yeah, language. very important. I think I think that every language has its spirit. There is there just mm -hmm. I don't I don't have another way to describe it. It's probably like a comp many things that come together to form the spirit, the sound, the the imagery, the you know various things. But every language has its spirit, and that spirit, in like very strongly takes you in a, in its own direction when you compose. You mm -hmm. you you as like it sort of kidnaps you as a composer. You know. I, so I have a question. Also, you know, I was also even asking sometimes students or friends, if you, for example, take Mussorgsky uh, songs and if you translated the text. To the different language, I'm sure Mussorgsky would use different harmonies because yeah. every language has different colors and color, uh, harmony has to match the color. So actually, the colors of the music that we hear harmony is related to the colors of the language. So very they, much, uh, very, very much, much, very much, very much so. Yeah. And in fact, like on some in some instances uh, where I was translating my, you know, I would write a song in Polish and then translate it into English. I remember obsessing about trying to find. Uh, not only uh, using words that are, you know, the the equivalent uh, mm -hmm. in the other language, but also placing them in such a way where I would have similar sounds at the same time. So if there was like an O oh in the Polish, I wanted an O oh in the English or something so like it. Or orchestration different or no? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the orchestration, but also just how I set, you know, how I place the words uh, and and which words I choose to translate something. Um, you know, Robert, it, we listen today at the end of this conversation, actually the piece that you did as a kind of transcription from the Polish. It's called the Dark Lullaby. So uh, we listen to that. But you did that after the Polish version. You did a, from the piano Polish version. You did an, a transcription for orchestra and the voice, right? So mm -hmm. can you tell us how did you deal with this topic in this particular piece? Because that's exact example that you transcribe it to the to the different medium and the different language. Yeah. So so the poetry itself, uh, as you said, it, I first set the original Polish, which is by Baczyński, and it's and it's just a beautiful sound, beautiful sounding poetry. But very dark, and very dark colors, always very, very oh, dark yeah. colors. And I just I took this moment. I remember how 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 inspiring that, that that just the sound of this poetry was and and it it really felt like almost the music was writing itself out it was coming out of the poetry when i was translating it my first instinct was to look for a translation that's already out there and i found one um i forget who it was that translated it and i tried matching it with uh, with the music and it didn't work it didn't work mm -hmm. like the sounds were not right the, it, it just didn't have the effect and i kept um so eventually i ended up translating it myself again where i chose different words a uh, different translation of some words and um and then i still had to mess around with sort of the poetic order of words within a sentence so that I, I place sounds more or less in the right places. Uh, mm -hmm. I, the, the, the right vowels, especially the vowels are important because they give so much color. So that's how you did, oh, I see, okay. 
I'm just curious, you mentioned about this, bringing this Polish spirit, Polish language to the, also the teachers. You know, I know that Steven Stucky wrote this piece, who was your teacher at Cornell, Ulajze Jezunio, which is the Polish, because you were very inspired by Lutoslavski, who wrote a lot of writings. But you know, did, did you also bring him this kind of Polish language? Because I'm not sure if Steven Stucky could speak uh, Polish, but I could find out this piece for choir, Ulajze Jezunio. You yeah. know that piece, right? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. I mean, yeah. Steven Stuckey, he, um, he, well, he didn't speak Polish, but he, he, but he, but he spoke a little bit, and he really tried, you know, mm -hmm. because obviously he, he, you know, he had a great respect for Lutosławski. He knew Lutosławski. He wrote a book about Lutosławski. They spent time together, so I think Steven Stuckey was always curious about the Polish language, and he sound. enjoyed it, the and sound it, of it, uh, and he, he liked the sound. Okay. Yeah. I so see. he would always try to learn, and he would always ask me like, "How do you pronounce this?" or "How do you say this?" And whenever he could, he would try to say some little things to me in Polish. Um, so, 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 yeah. I mean, um, the thing with Steven Stuckey was though that he was. He was like a walking encyclopedia. He knew everything. It was hard to actually show him something that was new to him. He or he, the chances were that if you, he already knew it. You know those poems or something. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> he is just incredible, incredible sort of mind. You know. So yeah. he knew Baczynski, probably. Did he know Baczynski? Oh, he must have. He must he have. Must I don't have. remember that part. Okay. At, you know, at this point, but it was it was now many yes, years ago. Yes, because but... what I'm asking because you mentioned that you wrote a long time ago this piece that's dark lullaby. So I was curious if you showed this piece to. Oh yeah, yeah. Students. I was still I... I was still his student at that point. So, so... that would be something different um, because we have this. Well, I'm at the city director of the Chopin and Friends Festival, and our idea is also my idea is always try to connect people through Chopin in the modern world in 21st century, and I'm also asking the visual artists, all know, actors, and also uh, performers, not only pianists, how, how do they feel with the music of the Chopin, if it's important for us, and do they still feel that it's like a grandfather? How is Chopin for you in your music? Is he still a, a very important? So the, the first thing I'm going to say to this is that we wouldn't be sitting here right now and talking if it weren't for Chopin. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because uh, we, we, that's completely we owe it to him, because uh, when I was a kid, you know, and I decided to you know, to be a composer, it is because I wanted to be like him, you know, because I heard his music. Uh, do you and remember the I, first piece you ever heard by Chopin? Do you remember that? Of what course was? I do. It was actually the um, the very first waltz. The, 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 the E flat major? The E flat major. Pa, 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 that one. Okay. And I, and I remember I heard it. And strangely enough, when it comes to that part, I started crying, you know, even though the music is happy, but there was something about the nostalgia of it, the kind of, and I was crying and and it was, and that's when I discovered Chopin. And from there, I started listening to more and more. Eventually I heard all of Chopin and then I wanted to play all of Chopin and I got far, you know, I played at this point, I think most of his music. And uh, and that's what was driving me, and and uh, and it took you know it it was several years of this before I started realizing wait there is all these other things and there's more contemporary <laughs> things right um, so but but the the formative influence of Chopin was tremendous on me and then um, you know and then of course once I became a student and everything then then I kind of departed from for, from Chopin in a way because then uh, I started discovering contemporary composition and in some ways wanted to distance myself from this kind of romantic from the romanticism the stylistic romanticism uh, and then only to return to it again so so even you know the 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 work that you're planning to um Present. To play to, to, yeah i mean it's it's essentially like a it's, it's a very romantic piece and in the very tonal uh, harmony and very melodic um and i think even since then i mean my music has gone in further in a different direction in a way but but i still feel deeply connected to chopin in the sense that this is still my ultimate kind of ideal of music, you know, mm -hmm. the balance between melody and harmony, how the melody is so important for him and melody is also most important for me. The transparency, the kind of simplicity on the surface, but trying to, to have complexity on it on deeper levels, um, the contrapuntal thinking. I mean, there are just so many things, uh, not to mention the kind of Polishness of it, which is not not kind of a blatant Polishness. It's, he's not quoting anything. It's just Polish because 
that's his soul, you know. But uh, maybe it has the spirit of the Polish language. Maybe. Maybe it has the spirit. Maybe, maybe it's connected to the language. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like you know I'm. Uh, uh, yeah. I, but I'm so glad to hear that you also started your journey with music from Chopin because I was also the same guy. But like you too, my huh? friends, I listened to Ara, uh, Harasiewicz, Adam Harasiewicz performance of yeah. the Polonaises, and that was the first cassette player that I heard my, and that's why I decided to I love music because of Chopin. Was it that cassette that had this? Because I had these two cassettes, and one was the Waltzes one, and the other one was Adam Harasiewicz. The Polonaises, uh, Polonaises, the, the Polonaises. I listened to Eiffel yeah. Major. Yes, that's the one. That's the one I had, yes. So we had the same tape. But do you think that Chopin was an um, experimental composer? Because I yes. think he was. E ex experimental? You, you yes, me experimental. You? Well, yeah, I mean, I think he was, in terms of, of harmony, um, especially in terms of harmony, absolutely experimental. I mean, his harmony is probably the most advanced, mm -hmm. uh, you know, common practice, like tonal harmony there, there is. I don't, even Wagner, who, you know, lived later and is often said to be very inno innovative uh, harmonically, uh, he doesn't really go anywhere far beyond Chopin, you know, it's all already in Chopin. And Chopin um, does harm, just, it, it's, it's a harmony that sounds so easy and simple when you hear it, and so smooth, yet, does absolutely crazy stuff like when you look closely you know um but uh, but he heard he, it was so um, intuitive how he heard it and so natural that that nobody else is able to accomplish yeah. this nobody but, else but you know chopin was not always tonal if you can look sometimes some elements in the music it's not always tonal you know you yeah so it definitely can can go yeah i mean if Beyond. you look at like the last movement of the B flat uh, exactly. minor sonata or something, of you know, course. that's, that's My borderline atonal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or the some could... of the preludes, E flat minor, something goes beyond the tiny preludes, go sometimes beyond the tonality, you know. Exactly. But yeah. the thing about him was that no matter what what he wrote, it was always like beauty and 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 this kind of actually very old ideal of beauty was always there, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, Chopin didn't even like Beethoven very much because he thought that Beethoven was kind of too out of balance, like things were too too loud, too noisy, too un un disproportioned somehow. You know, he liked it. He had this kind of ideal of beauty that was um, it was very classicist in a way, but then uh, but then he pursued it with such uh, just uniqueness. You know, he had such a unique uh, approach to it that it was extremely colorful yeah very colorful very colorful yeah. yes with all of the element musical elements but that's you know that's about chopin and now let's come back also to you and i want to maybe ask you the last few um, question about your how what did you compose in the last year and how did you compose how did you feel it being isolated and what are your plans for the next 2021 and 22 so yeah it was it was odd what happened like when this pandemic started i had so many there were a lot of big projects that were cancelled i had a couple of opera productions and this and that and everything just went out the window so okay. postpone or cancel that's also interesting. you don't know it's hard to say with some uh -huh. of these things you okay. know okay. because it's, it's maybe theoretically postponed but who knows like things so many things change during this time you know directors someone might be a director of an orchestra and then a year later is not the director of this orchestra You're anymore right. and that's right everything moves so i i don't know whether some of these things will actually happen still when things return to normal or if they will just be gone forever i don't know but um at the beginning I, so i wrote uh, several pieces and the the first piece i wrote was uh, a was a kind of a concerto for large orchestra and for bassoon, which I actually wrote for uh, for a Polish bassoonist, um, mm. Jarek, Jarek Augustyniak, who is um, the principal uh, bassoon of the BBC Wales Orchestra. And he asked me for a bassoon concerto. Uh, there are not so many bassoon concertos. Very not so rare. many, yeah. exactly. Panofnik and did, I, Panofnik did, but not, not so many Polish composers. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's rare. And, and I wrote actually a concerto that was uh, inspired by Polish painting, uh, by this... Um, by so-called naive Polish painting of a, of a lady who was just a farmer, basically, and in her very old, old age, when she was in her 90s, started painting, uh, Genoveva Maghiera. And so I, I, um, I wrote this concerto, which is called Zwierzęta idą do nieba, the animals are going to heaven, which is, mm -hmm. which is uh, one of her paintings. It's very kind of exuberant, very simple, but almost, almost kind of childish, but very beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wrote this bassoon concerto. Then 
after that, I just decided to, um, I wrote a marimba concerto and for no purpose whatsoever, I just had this idea and I wrote it. Um, then there was a period when I, um, when I did some arrangements uh, for things to be performed, to be performable during the pandemic, like for instance, that dark lullaby that you will play later, I actually oh, yeah. made an yeah. arrangement of it for choir because Ooh. there was a choir in Texas that said we would like to do it. Uh, and I, and I transcribed it for choir. I most recently now I composed um, a horn trio. So a piece for horn, a violin and piano. I just finished it a few days ago. Oh, congratulations. So a lot of stuff. A lot of a lot, yeah, I actually, it's, it's, it's quite a bit. And I feel like I'm still missing some, some big things that I wrote. Uh, uh, the, the, oh yes. I wrote, um, uh, um, a kind of a triptych of orchestral pieces in memory of John Paul II. So the first one um, is... Uh, last it's, year it's was not... the year anniversary, last year. No. Yeah, exactly. And, and it started, I wrote a first movement first, which was called Veronica. And it was all based on the poetry by John Paul II. Then the second movement uh, also, I added a second movement, which was called Simon the Cyrene or the Cyrene. And then third movement, which was called The Mother. And actually that triptych was just recorded in Poland uh, last week I think they recorded it mm -hmm. and it's going to be broadcast on Good Friday oh. and I don't have the link yet or the coordinates but I know that it somehow goes through the embassy in Canada the Polish embassy in Canada I think they are uh, sponsoring or co-sponsoring this and I know that the premiere of this it's a 20 minute uh, orchestral piece with soprano and narrator that's going to be done um, on Good Friday, yeah, oh, well. they, they, they recorded, so they already pre-recorded uh -huh. it with both sound and visuals. In um, I think they recorded no. it not in Warsaw. No, I think it was Warsaw. in Kalish. I forget now where it no, was. I think it was Kalish. Okay. Um, but it's going to be broadcast on YouTube. Uh, and I don't know the exact time yet. And, and I don't know the coordinates um, of the, the, the that's channel. A project, but it, that's a big project. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so that was a fairly big one. Mm. And otherwise, actually, I have been just teaching myself a little bit about electroacoustic music, just because, you know, you sit at the computer all the time in isolation. So I thought, well, I have never done this really. So I, I've been teaching myself uh, about synthesizers, about, uh, you know, and, um, and I'm actually thinking, uh, I have this commission uh, to write a piece, again, for Carnegie Hall, where we saw each other last time, oh, uh, yeah. um, a piece that would commemorate Stanisław Lem, you know, the Polish science oh, fiction writer. We have this year of Lem. Exactly, it's the year in Lem. So the plan is that I will write now a piece for um, uh, violin, piano, synthesizer, and narration uh, to be performed hopefully sometime in the fall this, uh, this year in New York again. If they reopen, currently. If they reopen, if they reopen. And uh, I thought <laughs> that the synthesizer would kind of work nicely here because of the science fiction topic. Uh, yes, you know, yeah. it would give this kind of other dimension. Like, yeah. Yes. But so, it's also a good topic because this year we landed also in Mars, right? We have this. <laughs> That's right. And it's very related to the idea of LAM, you know? So yeah. good year. Good year for yeah. LAM. Yes. Yeah, so hopefully, exactly. So this time when you'll be in New York, so for sure we we'll, I will hear come to listen to this piece. Exactly. So we will have a chance to see each other again. Yeah. Each other, yeah, in person, yes. But now that's everything actually is fantastic because you know so many projects, Norbert, it sounds great. You wrote a lot of music. Thank you very much for this conversation. You've been already for 12 years in Canada. It's been a long time. And I hope soon you, that the concert live will come back. We will hear live those concerts that you might see you in the fall at yeah. uh, the Carnegie Hall, if everything will go well. With me, probably it's getting better and better vaccination, so there is a hope for that. Mm -hmm. you know, and I wish you also a lot of inspiration and having a great year, new works to come, and great students and inspiration of your former students. So thank you thank very you. much for this conversation. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you and all the good wishes to you as well. I, I, I wish you all the best and uh, hopefully things will return more or less to normal and you stay creative and just our cultural lives you know, returns somehow. Yes. Now we are going to listen to this. It's dark, but it's, it's, okay. It's at the end. It has hope. It's, it has hope. It has yeah. hope, but it's a lullaby. Okay. So it's a dark, but lullaby. So we are going to listen exactly. now dark text to the Kamil uh, Baczynski. And Krzysztof Kamil Baczynski. Uh, yeah. Krzysztof Kamil Baczynski, but with your music. Okay. That's right. Okay. Thank you very much and enjoy. Great. Have a great Talk day. To you.